Welcome everyone to today's session and our discussion on how BMC Helix Discovery can pay for itself in less than six months. As you know, keeping track of an entire IT estate has become really complex. It's a hairball of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, containerization, on-prem. You can't manage what you can't see. How are you going to keep track of it all? Well, I've got the answer for you. It's BMC Helix Discovery. We've got best-in-class asset discovery and dependency mapping, which includes a start anywhere application mapping, service blueprints. Just imagine one single screen or one single scan, sorry, for all your environments and services. With that little teaser of the power of BMC Helix Discovery, let's move on to the topic at hand, the webinar. We've got a great webinar planned for today. <clears throat> We'll be hearing from Forrester analysts, Will McKee and White, who will discuss the current IT priorities, and Jeffrey Yauzik, who will discuss the re recent study that was conducted and how BMC Helix Discovery can deliver rapid ROI and help unravel that IT estate hair bow. Will, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Susan, for the intro, and hi, folks. Great to meet you all. As mentioned, my name is Will McKeon White, and I'm an analyst on Forrester's technology, architecture, and delivery team, aka the TAD research group, covering modern technology operations, aka what are the tools and technologies you need to actually make your employees successful. One component of that is I've had the opportunity and really the privilege of watching how technology and IT priorities and strategies have evolved over the past few years. And suffice to say, a lot has changed. And that's why I'm here with you today. Here I'll be talking about those priorities, what has changed, and what is missing from many organization strategies. And finally, how your organization can start solving for these gaps and really moving the needle forward on these critical gaps. And while this likely won't be surprising anybody, what we've seen in 2023 is almost a revision to previous priorities, only this time with increased urgency because of how rapidly environments have changed. Um, since the pandemic, we've seen organizations complexity increase consistently, whether it's introduction of yet more cloud assets, whether it's introduction of new technologies or experimentation with things like cloud native, what we are finding is organizations have these increasingly sprawling estates that they are increasingly unable to manage as effectively as they once were. And what this is directly leading to is organizational needs around security and customer experience. And so in 2023, CX and security are the top of mind for really every organization we talk to. What is um, somewhat further complicating this problem is other business priorities, namely, and most frequently being cost mitigation and cost reduction. 70% um, of decision makers relating to technology uh, report that they are going to have cost reduction and cost cutting as a higher critical priority over the next 12 months. And again, that's not really a surprise to anybody who's been um, paying attention to recent business trends, but what is happening as a direct result of this is this creation of almost a triangle or a triad of tension where organizations are being given mandates to do three potentially mutually exclusive things, <clears throat> improving experience, improving security, and reducing cost all simultaneously, which is a very difficult to say the least. And when an organization has this remit, it's extremely hard to identify where you can start to make a difference on all three of these things simultaneously without negatively impacting your ability to deliver on the other. And so the main thing I wanted to do here today is to start to give you 
some targeting data, if you will, to help better identify um, some of what might be causing underlying problems in your organization and how to achieve some degree of progress on all three of these objectives simultaneously, because they are very frequently, as I said, mutually exclusive, but that isn't always necessarily the case. And what we've identified are five really common IT challenges that IT teams are facing. And I wanted to give you some ways to both narrow down and identify if this is happening to you, as well as how to overcome these strategic impediments. So in all organizations we talk to about technology strategy, it is these five that are cropping up time and time again. Even when the expressed challenge to us isn't something about monitoring, I want to reinforce that is that these might be underpinning more systemic problems in your organization. And it might manifest as something like a team communication gap, something like people aren't talking to each other or uh, no team has adequate information in order to do their job, or something like a kludgy process that slows down delivery across the organization, or an experience complaint that you don't know how to start identifying or start to remedy because of how complex your infrastructure and application um, environment has gotten. And it might even be something like outages are happening more frequently than they should, and you don't know where to begin with this. So to provide you with some strategies for how to make progress on these contradictory priorities, we wanted to give you some explicit recommendations here and identify how you can begin to remediate this under the underlying challenges in an organization. So first is high cost of implementation and instrumentation of systems. And the catastrophic results usually of this is a deprioritization of end-to-end -end monitoring. Many organizations come to us saying that it's too expensive to instrument across their organization and instead are filtering down to only cover core environment or strategic systems. And what this directly results in is pretty frequently monitoring distrust because instead of actually having end-to-end -end visibility across the organization, you only have eyes on a very small slice or what has been identified as a critical slice of your infrastructure, which is needed and you should always have insight into this. But what we see is that it misses things like dependencies and there's these odd cascade effects that can occur that can cause an outage that you don't necessarily notice despite them impacting these theoretically monitored uh, monitored parts of the environment. And the way we see organizations almost trying to remedy for this is usually a patchwork of additional monitoring tools to try to bridge some of the situational awareness gap that we see emerging because of these high cost requirements or high cost impediments. The way to prevent this from appearing in the organization is um, unfortunately not necessarily just a technology solution, but instead a, one of achieving organizational consensus. So bringing together multiple groups who have obligations to your technology infrastructure and identifying which of their solutions can provide as comprehensive coverage as possible. And ideally, this also shouldn't be one that requires a massive reorg of how your organization's applications work as well, because this adds on additional friction and can cause further territoriality conflicts internally. The second problem organizations are very frequently running into is disparate or siloed pieces of monitoring are a result of these increasingly sprawling IT estates, whether you're using um, cloud or on-prem or uh, hybrid cloud environments or using containers, where APM, or application performance monitoring and infrastructure monitoring alone might have provided you with the situational awareness you needed. With this increasing complexity, we found organizations need to repeatedly rethink their strategy for the signal collection to 
collect more breadth and disparate types of information. How you know this is occurring in your organization are what I call known watermelons. The traditional watermelon description being uh, green on the outside, red on the inside. So when you have these systems that are saying everything is fine, but when you dig into it, systems are collapsing under their own weight, this is a result of a disconnected monitoring environment. So when you're theoretically, everything is theoretically okay, but you still have problems that you know of and that are even potentially customer impacting, this is usually from the lack of ability to draw correlation. When something goes wrong today, we find it is increasingly rare that just one type or one form of monitoring, whether it's application or infrastructure, is able to detect both the um, signal of failure as well as identifying the core of the problem or identifying what has fallen over or culprit system, if you will. And this phenomenon will scale as everything grows more complex. Fixing this requires usage of either one, integratable monitoring solutions that work very well together and requires, again, some degree of organizational consensus and testing and making sure everything plays well with one another, or having a single monitoring tool to cover part of this. Third are signal collection gaps, which are self-described here. Organizations like yourselves might have a gap, usually one they don't know about in their environment. And that is extraordinarily hard to identify and to begin to detect. It could be a piece of infrastructure or like an environmental type like cloud. It could be part of an environment, um, something like a, you've acquired a company and suddenly you're no longer able to fully monitor that environment because the tools are different than what they used and um, their license expired. Or the there's always the fabled server in a closet that's been running for 10 years and please don't touch it because we don't entirely know how to bring it back online when it goes down. A symptom of this and how to identify if this is happening in your organization is significant tribal or informal knowledge being used that isn't replicated in any system. Because if everything relies on the tap on the shoulder approach to figure out what is going wrong and you don't actually have a signal of this, that means you have these collection gaps because it relies on people knowing where the gaps are, but maybe not necessarily even recording them. The only way to better understand this and to identify this outside of a regimented knowledge collection process is through a better or understanding of organizational and technical dependencies, because then that allows you to start to trace the shape of your environment much more effectively than you previously have done and to almost outline some of these gaps to better understand what you do and do not have coverage of. Now, this could be already known in your organization, but very frequently we find that there might be known gaps as well as unknown gaps, and that dependency mapping is one way to start to bridge, um, <laughs> bridge the unknowns together, if you will. Fourth, organizational operation gaps are frequently a cause of tool sprawl and stem from organizational responsibility fracturing. A symptom of this is multiple discrete monitoring tools, very similar to the unintegrated problem before. And this is natural because one part of the org will be responsible for a very distinct part of the environment, whether it's infrastructure, application operations, or networking, and it's a logical way to structure teams. Everybody has their own discrete responsibility. What this can result in, however, is a set of tooling that does not interconnect and replicates these organizational silos, which cannot happen, that, because that creates signal gaps in uncooperative un monitoring environments. A system of this that is multiple overlapping solutions and what you have is redundancy. The way to avoid this is both through a centralized solution agreed on by organizational consensus that can be hopefully applied to multiple departments and multiple of these functions themselves. And most importantly, again, being able to map those dependencies because if you know how your technical environment works together, this can allow you to leverage into 
uh, conversations about how you can get these groups that are potentially even hostile to one another, God forbid, but in those instances, you can use this technical data to start to reinforce that certain groups have to work together. And why? Because you rely on one another. And if that is not replicated in your hierarchy, then it's very likely that this will be an ongoing cause of conflict in your organization and causing some of these more um, dramatic problems like an outage. And finally, uh, what we see still in many organizations of all different sizes and shapes today is the old static or potentially even manual data problem. A symptom of this really like the implementation cost is data distrust where employees will immediately dismiss information contained in a data platform or in a monitoring solution. They'll say, oh, that's not useful. If your monitoring environment is not useful, chances are it has something to do with one of these problems as well as some degree of manual reconciliation or data um, uh, data age that is no long that is rendering it no longer useful to your organization. And this requires constant assessment of effectiveness of your platform or of the platforms that you've chosen across the environment, because if they are no longer useful in your environment, if they're no longer able to track this information, then what good are they doing for you? How are they helping you make a difference in these priorities, whether it's that security, whether it's that cost, or whether it's that experience? If your monitoring is not useful, you are not able to identify the underlying root cause of some of these gaps in your environment today. And so what that leads us to, the really grand sum of all of this is many organizations do not know their environment as effectively as they should today. And that could and that's, could be caused by any one of the five problems I mentioned earlier or any permutation for the permutations of them today. But what we recommend organizations do to overcome all of this, what I wanted to leave you with today are these three steps. Beyond just some of the identification or remediation of the common problems, but if you have to shortlist, what should you start with and what should you make sure you have across your strategies? Number one, make sure you are centralizing management to decrease as many blind spots as possible, because this is one of the leading causes of things like security gaps. It is we had an unpatched system that we didn't know we had to manage or we didn't know of. Similar with cost, there could be an instance that was running or spun up by a developer a few months ago that is no longer being used and it is still incurring cost against our company. Or it could be experience where we didn't know these three systems were interconnected or we didn't know one system went down because somebody missed it or missed an alert and suddenly you are relying on tack on signals to identify what the core root cause of the problem could be. Two, leverage end-to-end -end monitoring as much as possible and to start to map those dependencies because those dependencies really are how your organization works. It's how information flows. And if you're not able to monitor these bridges or these roads, whatever metaphor you would like to use, then chances are you're not gonna be able to see traffic patterns as effectively as you should be. You'll just be able to see cars aren't flowing anymore and you don't know why. Dependency mapping helps all organizations understand how they work and how their environment works much better than most of these other approaches I've seen. And finally, this one's difficult for any organization and still very much emergent in practice, but connect your enterprise assets to experience to improve your overall understanding of how things work in your organization and to understand what it is actually like using your platform. And we're starting to see things like dedicated platforms being used for this, but just having this at the core of your monitoring philosophy, which is very frequently not done today, and instead we see people watching things like metrics proxies, 
if you aren't able to understand how people actually experience your environment, then you are ultimately not able to make a difference when it comes to things like those experience shortcomings that we are now being mandated to improve today for good reason. So realize I didn't have that much time with you today, but I hope these recommendations give you a way to start to improve your environment or at the very least validate that you're moving in the right direction and to provide additional detail on what your environment should look like and or really what transformations organizations have seen, um, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Jeffrey, um, who will be going, uh, going through the actual economic considerations of one of these approaches. So thank you very much. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Will. That was a great setup. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Jeffrey Yaswick. I'm a consultant in Forrester's Toll Economic Impact Practice. And today I'm going to be talking about our research on the Toll Economic Impact of BMC Helix Discovery. This is a full report. It's a case study that shows how, that talks about how real customers use BMC Helix Discovery to address some of the challenges that Will mentioned and also the business value of the benefits and the economic considerations um, surrounding their investment. I'm going to start off by giving some context and describing our methodology for this research. Then I'll talk about our results at a high level, then describe where all of our data came from. Um, and then finally, I'll walk you through our analysis step by step, and then we'll wrap up with uh, question and answer period. So just for context, um, <clears throat> Will talked a lot about his research and I think that Forrester as a whole recognizes that technology investment decisions are becoming increasingly complex. So to help with those kind of investment decisions, we developed a proprietary methodology known as Total Economic Impact or T. EI. TI is a way to make a business case for a technology investment. And it goes on, it goes beyond simple investments or uh, frameworks like toll cost of ownership or TCO, or just a simple ROI analysis by also being forward looking and considering risks as well as strategic uh, flexibility and the future potential of a technology investment. And we try to quantify all of that and wrap it up into our analysis. TEI has four pillars. Um, we first look at the business benefits that organizations are receiving from a technology investment. We also look at the costs or the effort that's necessary in order to realize those investments at the organizational level. Then we also look at flexibility. This is our way of considering what the strategic future looking benefits are of an investment decision, what value could be had in the future by investing in a technology now. And lastly, we adjust all of our business case calculations to account for risk, which is just our measure of uncertainty and variability in our calculations and a way of being more conservative in our estimates. A typical TI project can take months. We start with a period of due diligence in which we talk with other forest, in which we, the consultants, talk with other forester analysts, as well as the folks who are actually developing the, te the technology in order to make sure that we really understand the value proposition. And then we gather data. Uh, we do this by interviewing the customers who are actually using and adopting the technology in the wild. Now, this is really the hallmark of the TI approach. These customer interviews are um, just between us, Forrester, and the person using, and the organization using the technology. We don't have the vendor participate, so BMC is not part of those interviews. And that allows us to really get unbiased data. We are able, the customers are able to really speak and give us the full truth about their investment and their experience with the technology. Based on those interviews and the data that we gather, we aggregate and blend all of it into a composite organization and a financial model for that organization. 
and then we write up our findings in a case study and document all of our calculations, everything that we, all of our research and evidence and data um, so that other, we can be fully transparent and others can see how we arrived at our conclusions in our research. Then lastly, the last step is to review, finalize and publish. For BMC Helix Discovery and our TI case study of BMC Helix Discovery, we found that at a high level, the financial uh, investment in Discovery had a 314% ROI and yielded 7.1 million in benefits over three years. So those are really the top line metrics, but I want to explain how we got to those results. First, we interviewed four customers who had been using BMC Helix Discovery. And these were the anonymous or interviews that I spoke about previously, or the confidential interviews that I spoke about previously. These customers had a variety of deployments. They, some of them had only a few thousand assets, others had hundreds of thousands of assets. There were, there were a variety of assets in their infrastructure, IT infrastructure and environments. For example, we talked with two energy companies that had Internet of Things connected to their IT assets that their teams were responsible for managing. Before adopting Discovery, these organizations had cobbled together inventories of their assets from disparate databases, spreadsheets, and so on. Um, they were facing a few different challenges. Their prior approaches before Discovery had a few drawbacks. The first was that the processes required significant manual labor to keep their inventories and their knowledge of their IT infrastructure up to date. The IT teams were spending tons of time just entering information manually and updating it manually. Another problem was that they lacked end-to-end -end visibility of their environments. And as a result, some resources were being wasted. Uh, Will mentioned, for example, the server in a closet or the server under a desk. There were problems like that that were occurring that had impact on both budgets as well as operational implications. Another challenge that these organizations were facing was that their IT environments and infrastructure were becoming increasingly complex as the businesses were growing. So IT was having trouble keeping everything, their inventories um, up to date as is, and then the challenge was only becoming greater as the businesses continued to grow. They really lacked that single source of truth um, about, and they really lacked that single source of truth for their configuration management database, a CMDB. They had no way to reconcile conflicting asset inventory data and their existing databases were just full of errors and oversights. The major problem with this was that this led to security risk because you can't secure what you don't know about. So when we talked with some of these customers, they mentioned how this was really a challenge and a, uh, and a risk that they saw if they continued on their prior course. For example, the manager of infrastructure and design at an energy company said that cybersecurity vulnerability management and ransomware protection are very, very front of mind for us. We have national critical infrastructure, and so we get millions of attacks or attempts per day. And similarly, the IT director at another IT company said that what we wanted was protection. We wanted that instant view available into our hardware, our service dependencies, and our industrial data centers for security purposes. So with that in mind, the organizations hope to remedy these challenges by adopting discovery. They want to automate their asset management and reduce that manual labor involved with keeping their CMDBs up to date. 
they want to reduce their security risk exposure, reduce the burden on IT, and then also remedy the operational and budgetary issues that came from not having their IT resources optimized and right-sized. To make the business case for discovery, we aggregated all of the interviewees' data to create a holistic or representative story. We modeled um, the adoption of BMC Dis Helix Discovery on an organization with about 36,300 IT assets and 36 team members. We also included growth metrics in our model as well to account for the fact that the business was growing. This organization has about 10,000 employees. I think an important point to mention here is that our analysis and the benefits that we found are not limited to organizations of this size, and our model readily scales up and down. Uh, the customers we interviewed, as we saw previously, varied significantly in their size, but they were all realizing similar benefits from discovery and had, were facing similar challenges before they adopted it. And then lastly, like the customers that we interviewed, this composite organization, it was crucial for the business case that we modeled the adoption of discovery when the organization is going from a variety of homegrown and alternative solutions and manual processes, which are leading to that lack of end-to-end visi -end visibility and that lack of a single view of its assets. After speaking with Discovery customers, we quantified four benefits of adopting Discovery. We found that the customers' organizations were getting value from Discovery in four ways. The first was that their productivity of their IT ops team members, they were saving time managing assets. The second area of benefits was also faster recovery from downtime incidents and the value to the business of that increased uptime. We also heard about optimization and right-sizing of infrastructure, that is reducing the amount of infrastructure that is unused or underutilized, and the benefits on budgets and operational effort um, had value to the businesses as well. Lastly, we heard about improved security postures because the visibility that Discovery provided these customers enabled their IT teams to secure assets that were previously unsecured and thus reduce their risks. I'll go into each of these benefit categories um, more specifically now. The first benefit we heard about was that IT spent up to 15% less time managing infrastructure and assets after discovery. One interviewee, the ITSM expert and product owner at an automotive company, talked about their situation before discovery like this. We were exerting a lot of manual effort. We were entering information in a database, in a spreadsheet, and in a separate database, and then uploading them, keeping the data up to date, and so on. There was no automation behind it. I think that kind of challenge may sound familiar to, um, to folks. And then you can contrast that situation with how the manager of infrastructure and design in the energy industry described their uh, situation after discovery. This interviewee said the main benefit is the reliability that Discovery has demonstrated over the years. It's there, working in the background, doing millions of scans a day, and it requires very low maintenance. So IT Discovery ended up saving the IT teams at these organizations significant amount of times through automa automating tasks and responsibilities that had previously been mostly manual. Second, we also heard that IT was able to resolve downtime incidents, incidents up to 20% faster after Discovery. This was because Discovery provided these customer organizations with unprecedented visibility into their IT environments. The IT director in the energy industry said that, for example, before Discovery, our specialists would spend three to four hours tracing an issue, whereas now with Discovery, we get instant information. And then similarly, the, the general manager at an IT services company said, we tracked MTTRs for every month. Since discovery, we've seen almost a 20% improvement in MTTR. 
the faster resolution of downtime incidents translates into greater uptime. During downtime, business end users can't do their work, so we calculate and quantify this benefit by adding up the productivity losses that are avoided when IT can resolve those downtime incidences significantly faster. The third benefit we heard about was IT asset optimization. And to understand this benefit and how the organizations got value from using discovery, you can consider the experience of one of the energy companies. The manager of infrastructure said that proliferating virtual machines, that is virtual machines that were unused, were costing the company tens of thousands of dollars per year. This uh, customer said that without discovery, poor resource alloc allocation creates not only a budgetary issue, but also creates an operational issue. And that's where discovery came into play and said those machines aren't doing anything and they realized that they could decommission them. We heard from interviewees that after implementing discovery, they found about 5% of their assets were being wasted, that is unused or underutilized. After discovery, they were able to remediate about 90% of that waste, and this results in thousands and sometimes millions in savings. The last area of benefits that we heard about uh, were related to improve IT asset security and improve security postures. The manager of infrastructure in the energy industry talked about this benefit or described an experience that I think really captures this benefit well. Everyone remembers the Log4j patching craziness that happened all around the world. Without BMC Helix discovery, we would have been in a much worse situation to understand our vulnerability. But because they had a discovery, this interviewee said, we had a nice and definite list of what we needed to patch. So just kind of put simply, you can't secure what you don't know about. And we calculated based on the interviewee's data that they provided about a 95% asset security improvement due to knowing about what's in their um, IT asset environments. Pretty crucially, we also heard from interviewees about several qualitative benefits of discovery. And these benefits came from um, mostly from the dynamic service modeling capabilities that discovery has. Interviewees talked about how being able to see the relationships between assets and model services help them with their strategic planning and transformational initiatives as their businesses were growing. So for example, one of the interviewees said that Helix has helped us break down some of those large path-breaking changes. It has helped us significantly in our cloud migration system, entire system updates, upgrades, and transition. These are the enablers where we have leveraged discovery the most. In the TI framework, we considered this to be a strategic flexibility. The benefits of these initiatives were indirect and much harder to quantify, and the interviewers typically took advantage of these advanced capabilities later on or further into their um, deployments of discovery. The last part to note here on the qualitative benefit side is that the interviewees really reported very successful partnerships with BMC, and they all noted that BMC had superior customer support. I just covered the benefits of that the organizations receive from investing in discovery. But on the flip side, we also have the costs. Uh, the first source of costs was just the discovery licensing fees. And then the second was the implementation effort that is actually using discovery itself. Overall, we heard that implementing discovery was a relatively light lift for these customers. So for example, the manager of infrastructure in the energy industry said, I was new to discovery and I picked it up in just a few days. It's not a big learning curve. Once you get into it, you understand how much data this thing has. The interview has said that the core discovery functionality that they used to realize the four areas of benefits that I just mentioned was easy to learn. Some of them had yet to fully leveraged all of the advanced discovery features, 
but they all look forward to doing so and unlocking even more value for their companies in the future. All in all, the interviewees summed up their experiences with Discovery kind of like this IT director said. Discovery's help is constant. It performs 24 seven. It's keeping track of everything. For the interviewees, the four, they all realized the four direct benefits and then also long-term strategic value and the product just kind of worked for them. In summary, by accounting for both the benefits and the costs that the interviewees reported, we calculated that our composite organization realized a 314% return on investment from discovery. And so that means that for every $1 that they invested in the solution, the organization recouped that $1 plus gained an additional $3.14. For an organization like our composite that translated to 5.4 million in net present value benefits. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Susan. Well, thank you, Will and Jeffrey. Um, that was really great information that you provided today. With the 314% ROI, the 20% improvement in IT asset incident and recovery efficiencies, 90% improvement in IT asset optimization, and 95% asset security improvement it's impressive numbers um i i'll just put in my little plug and say thank you know take advantage of the bmc helix discovery in your environments and bmc superior support so let's start the q a portion of the call if you can please put your questions in chat we can address them there now i do have will one or ready for you. Um, you had talked a lot about what you're seeing as far as out in the market outlook. Could you go a little bit further on that and what you think is going to be the ongoing issue for us moving forward? Yes. Oh, very good one. Uh, let's see. So ongoing market outlook and challenges organizations are facing continue to really align with those three priorities I talked about quickly in the beginning, which is the um, holes in security, holes in experience, and overall paying too much for what they're doing today. And in every single conversation we have with organizations, usually one of those three is coming up again and again and providing a pretty critical impediment to them achieving their overall objectives, which is getting a better visibility, which is getting better visibility and starting to automate more inbound instance requests. So long term, we see organizations using tools that can do things like automated predictive remediation that are able to cover for all environments, um, whether it is something like a server, what it's sorry, I should say, rephrase this, whether it's serverless, whether it's cloud native, whether it's on-prem, whether it's a traditional architecture, et cetera, et cetera. We anticipate these platforms being able to detect and map all of these together, how they all work and what this means for end users. This is sort of what we see today and we're only going to see these getting better and more self-propelling into the future, which is great and all, but you gotta start somewhere. And it's very difficult for most organizations to start to break through all of this and to start to divine how to proceed within this uh, mutually exclusive priorities environment. And really, I think what organizations need to start with in the sort of five recommendations I had is start to identify some of those signal collection gaps or where things rely mostly on tribal knowledge, because that is one fairly foolproof way that organizations can check for their own gaps, where they are missing something, where they do not have adequate signal collection and intelligence. And so if I had to project out where things will be going and how this market is going to continue to evolve, it'll be organizations emphasize and prioritize that as a mechanism to start 
getting us to be a higher priority internally, getting organizational alignment, and then can start to improve on these higher level objectives as well. Uh, apologies for a uh, rapid and uh, multi-pronged answer to that question, but I, I hope that all makes sense. And if anybody in the chat would like me to go a little bit more in depth into any one of those parts, be more than happy to. Thanks, Will. Getting a lot of notifications that folks are not hearing us right now. Um, oh. We seem seem to have lost um, the audio. Fascinating. And yes, I've I've gotten three notifications that they're not hearing us. I'm gonna try to swap and see if. Okay, so it sounds like uh, I'm seeing in the chat some folks yeah. can hear us and other folks cannot. Mm. Interesting. I am uncertain as to what the cause of that would be then. I don't know. Well, I think hopefully we can go ahead and there's a couple more questions in chat other than the fighting with the can't hear. And I hope we can get that set helped um but jeffrey there was one in here um you had mentioned security was an issue for many of the organizations that forrester worked with for the study are there other security stories that you've heard about in addition to those that relate to discovery that you could share yeah sure so we heard from one of the customers that there were actually three separate um, incidents in the past year that they were able to avert um, because they there was some incident in the larger cybersecurity landscape that they heard about. They're able to look at discovery, check their inventory of assets, and see what they needed to patch, where they needed to plug any holes, and um, discovery enabled them to rapidly uh, reduce their their security risk and then we also heard from another organization that was in IT services and they had a very sophisticated internal measure of security risk um, that before discovery was they uh, colored it amber um, as their risk posture and then after discovery that went down to green and that was partly because they had such a complex environment um, and ecosystem of assets that they were able to identify patch and update everything to make sure that they were fully secure against um, potential potential threats and potential risks mm -hmm. And I would just add on a quick additional detail there, because I see actually another question in the chat specifically relating to the explicit benefits and how this helps organizations with their own security postures. And it is that identification and remediation part of this, where if you don't have adequate insight, you don't know what you own. And if you don't know what you own, you then cannot secure that, or you cannot guarantee security as much as if you do actually have adequate insight there. And so when it comes down to sort of security best practices, the standards all still apply and making sure you are up to the latest patches, you've got all the secu latest security installations on, you've got all the adequate protections and et cetera. These all are still the fundamental core of this. And this just helps you ensure that you're able to apply that across the rest of your organization, or it is a component of your security strategy that helps ensure that you have better visibility than you otherwise would have. Thanks. Um, I do have another question, and Shafi, who Shafi Mani, who is on the line with us, is the product manager for BMC Helix Discovery. And Shafi, I'll throw this one over to you. In that um, we have on-prem client management. Is this a cloud-based platform of the same? Yeah, so I can click in it. Yeah, and at the moment it's on prem. Um, yeah, we, we don't have any um, SaaS version. 
for this for the for the BCM client uh, solution at least. Okay. And let's see. Will I think this one would go to you. Uh, the study was really informative. My company is a bit smaller than the composite company. How do I relate this to my business? Can I justify the expense? I'd say that's an excellent question. Um, and, and Jeffrey, I would actually defer to you on specifically how the model can be adopted to that. But one thing I do want to encourage all listeners here today is to look at the specific model included in the study, because this includes things like numbers of the organ, uh, numbers of employees and size of the organization. And once you're able to adjust those numbers to your size, then this provides a pretty good way to estimate out what your own business case can be. Um, and that all of this is sort of built to work within itself and to allow you to customize it to the degree where you need, because all of the logic that we include is usually explicitly detailed out. But Jeffrey, I'll uh, turn it over to you to see if uh, there's anything more specific you would recommend there. Well, that's that's exactly right. Um, the detailed and complete model is contained in the case study and all of the calculations and tables are fully customizable so that you can swap in your metrics for uh, the metrics of the composite organization and see what your redo the calculations and see what your potential ROI could be. Um, also after playing with the model a lot uh, the results are consistent scaling up and down um, to different size organizations. And the just to wrap up and re-echo uh, what Will mentioned, the full case study is as transparent as we can make it, and it's intended to help with that. Okay. I've got a question, and I think, Will, I'll throw this over to you first. Um, and then Shafi, if you want to add in, um, what are the main manual tools that the customer was using or the customers were using that um, ended up being combined so they could use discovery as one single source of truth? Mm, good question. Yeah, I mean, there's no simple answer. Yeah, it can be spreadsheets, it can be text files. We have seen a lot of those. Um, and also, it's not just manual tools. Also, there can be a lot of um, what they call a single source of truth. And then essentially, you have 10 sources of truth and no one really knows what's going on. So you have a combination of all those scenarios that we experience in the world, um, right? And then again, it depends on the complexity of organizations, small, medium, large. Um, so yeah, it, it's all of that, basically. Very much agree, and it's really the silos of information that you have internally in an organization, whether it's that manual, whether it's the automated systems, helping you bridge between those and to start to do things <laughs> like manual, instead of removing, or I should say, removing manual dependency mapping and things like that goes a long way in just time savings and actually making the information usable. Because if the last time you did an update or last time you synthesize the data between all these information silos was maybe like two weeks ago and that's not what your environment looks like anymore then that information is no longer useful so you have to have something that can help you do this in an automated fashion and the more automated it is the less work you have to do on an ongoing basis which turns it into ultimately more usable information Indeed, and I just want to add one more point, right? I, I think this becomes much more important because as the world is going towards cloud and you know, uh, ephemeral um, data stores and stuff like that, where containers can go up and down in minutes, things that are, I mean, if you have information that is dated a week ago, it, it probably much be useless, right? Um, so, so the intent would be to how we can make one system that can be accurate and close to real time to make sure you have the latest and greatest information, right? Which has been our focus essentially. Awesome. All right. Um, I do have, and well, I'm. I apologize. I keep kind of throwing it to you and Shafi, but the. the <laughs> um, I. The comment here was: I noticed you interviewed <clears throat> a few industries 
Is it something that's applicable to all industries? Is there a particular industry that was not part of the study that might benefit as well? I would say I've not run into an industry where this would not be helpful. Uh, unless you are one of the rare organizations who already has 100% visibility into your environment at all times, uh, this is something that can still apply, very much apply to you. And organizations I've talked to across all different verticals and even sub-verticals tend to be running into very similar problems, even though they may articulate it slightly differently. Okay. Just reading through, let's see, is, dis is discovery, and Shafi, I'll let you answer this one, is discovery both on-prem and in the cloud? So we have it available for both sides, correct? I just reply that, yeah. Okay. I think there, there was a question regarding um, uh, how the clients are asking on um, faults and stuff like that, which I think is probably more from a support standpoint. So um, Jeffrey, will any, I think you did mention superior, to, so, um, superior support, right? Anything specific on this that you can add from your study standpoint? Uh, sure. Yeah, so on that point, um, we heard that from the customers that BMC was both very responsive to their needs in the short term, and also that they were really helpful in terms of the long-term strategic partnership, making sure that uh, the organizations were leveraging the advanced features, especially as they were planning important things like migrations and so on. Um, but all the customers reported really strong partnerships and really felt uh, embraced by BMC's support. Thank you. Okay, I think I've got time. Well, let's see. Yeah, I've got time for one last question. Uh, Jeffrey, you had also talked about asset incident resolution. And, and in the study, there was a 20% improvement. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, two examples from the case study come to mind. Uh, the first was from an IT company that talked about how um, every step of the way they realized improvements in uh, improvements in response to incidents. So uh, this company reported that their time to response improved by 20 to 25 percent. And then their time to resolve improve, resolve improved by 12 to 13 percent, and overall the mean time to recovery improved by more than 20 percent. And then another organization reported that was able to quantify and said that their um, resolution hours, that they the time required to resolve dropped by 50 percent. Uh, so we were actually conservative in modeling the. 20% improvement and we often heard from customers that they are actually realizing much greater uh, improvements. Okay well I know we're at the top of the hour so I think we'll have to close the call. There are still some comments coming here, some questions coming in so we'll get back to you on those as quickly as possible. And thank you everyone for joining us today.